Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Uncut. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're very honored to have as my guest, Dr. Jaime Awe. Jaime is, has been one of my favorite interview subjects over many years. I think, Jaime, I've probably been interviewing you for almost 20 years, back to when you were at the Institute of Archaeology at NICHA. And now, Jaime is a professor at Northern Arizona University. And he's here for the summer, as you do every summer, Jaime. You come here every summer for your digs, and you bring a number of students. I know you've had local students participating as well. Um, and this year, as per the norm, uh, you are at St. Ant Antonitz um, Baking Pot, and you are at your, your, the cradle of your knowledge, Cajal Pets, Cajal the Pets. place of the ticks. Yes. So explain to me, Jaime, um, what's it like every year coming home for these digs, uh, because I know that some part of you must be torn between Belize, where the where the corpus of your of your work as an archaeologist is, and in Arizona, where you earn a suitable living for someone with your level of training, and also the 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 many distinguished awards you've received as an anthropologist, even recently. Um. Yes, you know, obviously it's, it's always great to be back home. Um, Belize has always been and will continue to be home for me. And I think, you know, I, I feel really privileged, Jules, because unlike many Belizeans who go into other, you know, disciplines or other types of work, um, the work that I do allows me to come back home and to practice, you know, what my skills and... Um, you know, people have, you know, often uh, also ask me why, you know, why I left or do I miss, you know, having left. And, um, and the answer to the second one is, of course, I miss, you know, not being in Belize permanently. But I'm fortunate, too, that I can come back and continue to do some of the work that I was doing when I was with Niche and at the Institute of Archaeology. Uh, when I started this current project at Shenanta Niche, as an example, um, I continued to look for, you know, funding, not just to do research, but especially to do conservation work. And we have now conserved about half a dozen buildings at the site, uh, enhancing their tourism potential and, um, and really establishing them more, you know, as, a, as heritage sites that Belizeans can also go and enjoy. However, that notion of heritage tourism, Jaime, is not, it does not, it well with everyone because you know that some people say Maya temples, Maya ruins do not exist for the gratification of tourists and they're quite heavy calves as they trod up and down those sites. We do not exist for your gratification. Yes, and um, you know, when the way I, I look at it, my, my, my own perspective is that the archaeology of Belize really belongs to the people of Belize. Um, and we can sort of acquire a whole you know, bunch of different uh, benefits from our sites. Uh, you mentioned the, the tourism. Um, you know, tourism really contributes to the economy, to the national economy to begin with. But it also contributes to local economies. Uh, when I think of, let's say, I, I mean, since we started to use Shinantanich, let me continue to use Shinantanich. Um, we hire a lot of the, the local you know, people from the village of San Jose Socots. And it's not just my project, but also the Institute of Archaeology hires people from that community who then you know, participate in the maintenance, the conservation, the development of that park. Um, and that creates right, jobs within that community. It also creates opportunities for people who um, are tour guides. Uh, they can make a living and support their family by being able to take other visitors. And those visitors are not just foreigners, right? They're, they're Belizeans as well. 
but you know the tour guides can go there and they take a lot of pride in being able to share the knowledge and information that we as archaeologists provide to them through training programs that we have. Um, we have gift shops. Those gift shops create cottage industries. Um, we have people who are carving slate or making um, you know, baskets or, or they're you know, making other types <clears throat> of objects that you know, people can acquire and take back. So that again creates it. But I think even more important than all those, right? Those are the economic benefits from, you know, from archaeology tourism. The more important benefit to me is that it gives Belizeans a sense of pride. You know, I often, when I look at the, the sites, you know, having traveled to a lot of places in the world, Europe, Asia, and uh, Central America, and North America, one of the things that I, I feel when I come to uh, an archaeological site, especially after we've excavated them and conserved them, is that some of our first Belizeans were also incredible achievers. Right? They and their civilization can stand up there with any and every other civilization around the world. And I think that that's something for us as Belizeans to be proud of. Right? And so, you know, we cannot just look at, at the archaeological sites, you know, just from the lens of, of tourism. You have to look at it from the lens of, of you know, national identity, uh, of heritage, but also of education. But all of these things are are seen from within, and we're looking right now at the come come vase that we'll talk about shortly. But all of these things are seen, Jaime, through the perspective of the Western gaze, of the Western concept of what is exotic or what is attractive and what is what is what what holds some special intrinsic magic. But simultaneously there is such a disconnect between the modern Maya and the ancient Maya, and no one, no one is looking at the, at the humanity behind that. You're just looking, or the, the Western gaze just looks at the, at the legacy, at the exotic, at the, at the keepers of, of this magic, some intrinsic magic these people had to, to, to come up with all these astronomical precisions with the, with the data precision of the Com Com vase. So I, I like your, you know, sort of the direction that you took that, and here's why. Um, you know, archaeology has been happening for many, many years, and um, for the greater part of the history of archaeology, it was mostly foreigners doing that archaeology. And I remember some of my students, both my Belizean students here, because we have, as you pointed out, we have a lot of Belizean students working with us, right. um, but also the foreign students. They have said to me that one of the things that they enjoy about my class or my course is that I bring an indigenous perspective to it. Okay. And let, let me explain how that is, is really important. To, you know, back in time, I remember when I was uh, a student in, in archaeology, um, you know, some of my, prof my professors used to refer to the mysterious Maya. And, right. and then they also used to say, how could these people develop a civilization as amazing as they did, living in this inhospitable jungle environment, et cetera? Right. And I remember standing, you know, sitting at, you know, in the middle of the classroom, and I sort of raised my hand to the professor. And I said, you know, the jungles aren't inhospitable. That we Belizeans live in that environment, right. and we enjoy it. In fact... When I'm in the jungle, I can see a lot of trees that are beneficial that we can use. And I said, but even more important, I, I was studying in Canada. I said, I would rather be lost somewhere in the Belizean jungle because I know I could survive than to be lost in the Canadian tundra because you'll freeze to death. I said, I'm not going to freeze to death in, in, in the jungles of Belize. So, you know, this concept um, of mysteriousness, too, I, I, I said... I have a lot of friends who are, who are Maya, my neighbor. Uh, in fact, my family, I did my DNA, and you know, my, my family, we have a percentage of native indigenous um, heritage uh, as well. And so, you know, again, I said, 
they're not mysterious. You know, they're my neighbors, they're my cousins, they're my uncles or my friends. Um, and, and I think that by us, people like myself, other Belizeans, and I, I have several colleagues, both at, uh, at Niche and in other branches of Niche, who are, you know, part native or sometimes, you know, 50% or 100% native. And I think that our voices are important to start to change that old narrative, right? And to say, hey, you know, the, the Maya were not mysterious. They were human, but very accomplished. And so I think that archaeology allows us the opportunity to, to, to bring that to the fore. I take your point, but you said a, a critical thing. They, they, you know, they're not exotic. They were human, but they are human, and they're present. Yes. And, well, and I, what, how do we connect or how, how do we live in a state that divorces these two realities? How do we bring them, how do we bring those together meaningfully? I think through education. Um, we know that, you know, we, you know, Belize, like most of Central America, had a colonial past. And we know in the case of the Spanish, um, and to some degree, I guess, the, the British do. The British did not have as much interaction, like, let's say, the Spanish, uh, with native groups throughout Mesoamerica. And the reason is because the, the Spanish controlled greater areas of, you know, Central and, uh, and, Meso and, and greater Mesoamerica. But there was a purposeful move by, you know, by Europeans to try to create that disconnect to, 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 to a large degree between right, the Maya or the Aztec or the, you know, or the Inca in the South right. America or the, you know, the Totonacs, or the, you know, the folks in Oaxaca. Um, and you know, they, they introduced their own systems of governance, of perspectives, whether it's you know, political, social, cultural, religious in particular. And the, you know, the introduction of Catholicism tried to force the removal of some of the belief systems. And so, you know, today's modern indigenous groups have that disconnect that you were talking about because it was almost forced on them. And so how do we get that connect back? And that connect is not just with indigenous groups, like, you know, in, like I said, in Belize, just Belizeans in general. And I think that through education, by, by talking about some of the achievements of the Maya, by saying, look, you know, we have reasons to celebrate the, the, this cultural heritage that in many ways it's special and unique. But what about community-based archaeology, where the community validates, the, the relevant community, the relevant indigenous community validates what the Western-trained Archaeologists, it may be indigenous, it may be you, a Belizean, but still the, the, the methods and, the, and the, the practice is Western, which is intrinsically looking from the outside in, right? Mm -hmm. As outsiders. That's, the, yeah. that's what anthropology is, an outsider's perspective. But I'm saying that what about community-based archaeology that, that forces you, the archaeologist, not to come up with your theory, but to ask the community to involve them. Yeah. And we've been doing a lot of that. Um, let me give you some examples, you know, from my project. Um, and, you know, maybe to some degree my project might be different just because by the virtue of the fact that I'm from Belize. But when I started <clears throat> archaeology quite a number of years ago, and in fact, when we started the... Quite a number of years. <laughs> I like that. Uh -huh. Quite, you know, um, when we started the, the big tourism project uh, back in 2000, I remember, I, you know, I, had, I was called invited. called it TDP-1, I think. Yes. That and was TDP-1. Yes. Right. And, you know, at that time, I was teaching at the University of New Hampshire. And um, I was asked by the then minister responsible for tourism and culture um, to come to Belize and to, you know, to play an important part in not just organizing that project, along with my colleague, Alan Moore, um, and, you know, but not just to organize, but also to coordinate it so that for the first time, 
we would have Belizeans right, directing and running the project. Well, when I started to look at other Belizeans that could assist um, in the case of, let's say, conservation, we didn't have a Belizean conservator. And everyone said, well, you know, you're going to have to go to Guatemala or Honduras um, to look for conservators or in Mexico, and you're going to have to hire them and bring them here. And I thought, no, we, you know, Belize has to come of age. You know, we got to change that. We got to make, we got to bring in our community voices. So at the time, there was this young gentleman from San Jose Socots. Okay. And he had spent some time working with this Guatemalan by the name of Rudy Larios, a very well-known conservator. He did a lot of conservation work at Copan in Honduras and also at Tikal in Guatemala. Um, and I said, you know what? No, we can do it. We don't need it to bring in you know, other people to, to, to show us how to conserve. He had, he had already gotten some training. And, but we also wanted to conserve some of the, the big stucco masks and freeze right. that, that we have at uh, Shenantanich. And that we didn't have any expertise either. So there I was forced to hire this Guatemalan who knew how to, right. to do these fiberglass replicas. So we brought him over and I said, look, his name was uh, Gustavo, um, I think Valenzuela. And I said, Gustavo, I'll make a deal with you. I'm going to hire you for the duration of the project under one condition. You're going to train Belizeans how to do this conservation work. And I said, I have a little team that included, again, those indigenous voices, right? um, folks from San Jose Socots, from San Antonio, in Cayo. And I said, at the start, you're going to run the show training them. And so he did. And then once we left Chinantanich and we went to Caracol, I said, now I want them to do it and you'll supervise them. And after Caracol, all the other projects that we've done, if it's, you know, you look at Cerros, if you look at the masks at Lamanay, or any kind of monuments, in fact, the monuments we found at, uh, a couple of years ago at Chinantanich. Okay. It's all done by, you know, by members of our, our Maya communities. Um, I also, you know, when at San Jose Socots, for example, this Friday, I am meeting with the tour guides who want to come up and they want, to, you know, I'll be showing them some of the discoveries we've made and I'll help to train them. Sometimes they will come up and they will volunteer with us, but they also go, you know what? Have you thought about maybe conserving this building? And what we do is we ask, well, why? What, what do you think that that could contribute to, what, you know, to the way the site looks? And I think it's important for us to start to incorporate those voices. No question about that. Now, could we do more? I think we can always do a bit more. But I think we, you know, we started this trend that's really moving in the right direction. Should we require, and, and I was with you at the Caracol site when TDP was on, and I remember that, yeah. that aspect of it, that specific aspect of training locals. And, and while you know there are uh, do, those who oppose restoring those freezes, you know, we, we already spoke about that issue for touristic purposes, uh, heritage tourism, uh, like it or load it, creates a great deal of employment in our country. And that's a much wider philosophical argument which we brushed on. But should we require in Belize, we have so many ongoing excavation, uh, so many digs ongoing by foreign universities. You are the only one that I know of which is led by a Belizean. Should those foreign schools that come here should they not, as is, as is in the case in Mexico and in Guatemala, I believe, be required to work with a Belizean archaeologist? That's number one. Number two, should we not seek some type of reciprocity from the great gift they're gaining by, by use of our patrimony to get students into their school, not to study archaeology, because we know that can nobody pay archaeologists in this country? Only niche. There aren't enough jobs for archaeologists in this country. Make them trade Onoankoya. Take some of your students go study STEM. We need training in STEM. 
we could yeah. use that. Yeah. Shouldn't we try to work out something that gets us some reciprocity or footing? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, the, we, we have some challenges with some of those things. They're, they're all great ideas, and, you know, we, we've started to do more of it. Let me give you some examples um, again. So <clears throat> in the case of, you know, having all the, the foreign uh, projects hire some Belizeans or at least a Belizean counterpart, part, the advantage that Mexico and Guatemala have over us is that they have a university which trains archaeologists. archaeologists. Right. And so they have a lot of archaeologists there that they can then right, move into some of these various projects. We're right. not there yet. You know, um, when I was here, we, uh, we started the anthropology program at Galen University. And we tried to start one at, at UB. The one at UB never really panned out, but Galen still has an anthropology program. And so <clears throat> that's one venue for training Belizeans. Now, one of the things that we've also done is, and I think that, I, you know, I think it's important that other Belizeans know this. For some time, I was the only Belizean with a PhD in archaeology. Really? Today we have five and two in training. <clears throat> and in fact, right now, we have our first female director of the Institute of Archaeology, right. Dr. Melissa Badillo, who was assisted in you know, that reciprocity agreement <clears throat> by uh, Arlen and Diane Chase to, to go up to University of uh, Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. UNLV. Yes, and, and Mel finished her PhD there. She's back. She is now, like I said, head of the Institute of Archaeology. Um, Rafael Guerra, he was, again, assisted through a, a, a grant uh, to go to do his PhD at the University of New Mexico. He finished his PhD just a few months ago, and he's back in Belize. Um, the other, you know, so that, that's two, two of the others, uh, Dr. Morris, John Morris, and uh, Dr. Alan Moore. Uh, they said I came after I finished. And right now, we have Antonio Beardal, who is doing his PhD at Texas State University. Texas State had a project here. But before he went to do the PhD there, I was able to assist him to get a, 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 a scholarship to go to Northern Arizona to do his master's. And then we have Sherilyn Jones. Right. You know, she is in South uh, Texas. Doing, South Florida. Sorry, South Florida, doing anthropology. So... Again, you know, we're starting to train more and more Belizeans, and hopefully we'll be at that point where we can then tell each of these projects, well, you're going to have to have a Belizean counterpart. But is it worthwhile to train Belizeans to be a PhD in archaeology when really you know that they cannot earn what a PhD, they can't earn anywhere near what a PhD should earn if they come back to Belize? Yeah, that's, you know, that's going to be the, the, the challenge. Um, but, you know, you can still make a good living in Belize uh, as an archaeologist. Obviously, you, you likely need to work either uh, with Niche. I mean, I did it. Uh, you know, John Morris has been there for most of his career. The same with Alan Moore. Um, Melissa is now back with them. And um, it's possible that, you know, uh, Rafael Guerra will be joining them as well. Uh, some of us, when I was there at Niche, I also taught part-time at Galen University. So, you know, you can, you can do other things at the same time. Um, you know, can you be paid as much? Likely not. But, you know, a lot of times when you do archaeology, you do it for the love, you know, for the passion of it. Yeah. And, you know, Belize is a great place to do it. But, Jaime, with, with respect, you are the only Belizean who uh, has been able to, to parlay your quite significant uh, academic accomplishments into a teaching post, a professorial post at a North American university, and and that and that speaks to your preeminence as a as a Mayan scholar, but it also speaks to the fact that there just aren't that many opportunities. Yeah, no, it is challenging. It is challenging, and it's even challenging in North America too. You know, I know a lot of people who do PhDs and. Um, they can't get a job. Or if they get a job, you know, if you want to get tenure, um, you got to work hard. So then instead of, instead of I, I understand there are many 
young persons that want to be archaeologists, and certainly we encourage them in their, in their studies. It's an immensely interesting field. Shouldn't we try to refashion this reciprocity in a way that we can get people to go study things that, STEM. that we need? Yeah. STEM or STEAM <laughs> or something that, that is more immediately applicable to believe. We need archaeologists, no doubt. Yeah. But people who we can pay as industries expand, they, maybe they are, they are chemists or biochemists or engineers that know how air conditions work, yeah. that sort of thing. Shouldn't we look into that sort of a, a trade-off? Yes. Um, you know, we, again, we know that in Belize we don't have, you know, the opportunities to study certain sciences. And, um, and I think that in, in, in many ways we sometimes try to, uh, you know, acquire those kinds of scholarships, um, but we can continue, you know, improving on, on, on those opportunities. Um, I forgot to mention that um, our present governor general, you know, that she went to study anthropology. She did. Right. As part of, again, you know, one of these kinds of assistance through uh, an, an archaeologist that was working in Belize. And um, she studied in Texas. And, um, and then came back, and she worked with Niche for a while, and, you know, today she's the, you know, the governor general of Belize. But, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, you can, you know, there, there are lots, uh, you know, of other opportunities in STEM that we could then try to encourage Belizeans uh, to, to move towards. No, we're, you know, um, Jaime, one of the most sensational stories that, that we worked on was Nomul. And Lance, I think we have a picture of the Nomul uh, me and you, we, we met out there. Yeah. I think the first time I went out there was with CTV3. I called you. You were aware of it. And, um, and that's the interview you did at the time. I think the, I think the entire time, the, <clears throat> your, your hair was surprisingly more black. <laughs> I highlighted my hair. You highlighted. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. So, yeah, no more. And, you know, um, and we know what that whole scene was about. Uh, people were using, uh, uh, I'll say the name, Mr. Denny Grijalva, because it's been said many times, was using portions of that. He said not to his knowledge, but his workers did it, to make a White Mile Road. And a huge thing was made. He was criminally charged. I followed the case. You know, we, we've spoken about this hundreds of times. But... Let us be real. What Mr. Grijalva did is nationally and internationally known. Accepted. But, Ms. Dr. Awe, this happens quite often in Belize by Mennonites in their insatiable quest for arable land, for agronomy. Right in at the Blue Creek area and in other areas, I have been to, for example, um, Little Belize, where uh, 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 they had an expanse of land. Every step I took was a shard, an expanse of cleared land. Every yeah. step I took was a shard of pottery. I am saying, is this not an established practice by Mennonites and others, but I know it to be Mennonites, clearing out land for agrarian purposes yes it's it's a problem uh without doubt in fact jules um we just had the belize annual symposium right there was a hiatus because of the whole covid right. pandemic <clears throat> and during the the uh, symposium a couple of people brought that up in fact really one of the one of the foreign archaeologists uh has a permit to go into the area of Spanish Lakot, okay, all the way practically to the Guatemalan border. And she and her team, uh, both Belizeans and a couple um, students from, from the U U.S., they have been not just documenting all the cases of site destruction. I also you know, should let you know that uh, John Morris has now started, he had, he had a, a small project that he had began and then it went into hiatus, but he's now working at Aguacate. You know, the Aguacate Lagoon is just west of, of Spanish Lakota. Right. And one of the things that they've been doing is meeting with Mennonite leaders, Mennonite families, and requesting 
that they do not bulldoze many of the mounds out there. And in fact, they did, there were two, two presentations that focused on that topic um, because it is of serious concern. Um, you know, at the rate that land clearing is going on, you pointed out Little Belize. You know, that's the northeastern part of Belize. I've been up there. In fact, I went up there many years ago to look at this site called Kakantulich. Um, and, uh, and then also by the Blue Creek area where there's greater expansion. In fact, your son, Sion, worked with an American archaeologist, Tom Guderjohn, right. up by Blue Creek. And Tom, because of his concern as well, with site destruction, was able to raise funds in the U.S. to purchase a property, a section of the property from the Mennonites in Blue Creek to conserve a site. And, and so, you know, it's moving. We, 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 we're starting to see several initiatives that are directed specifically to trying to protect sites as a result of destruction by agro-development. Is this something that makes you lose sleep at night in terms of all the treasures of antiquity that have been lost? Oh, yeah. You know, when one of the reasons I, I started to work at Cajal Pech 30 years ago, Mr. Godsman Ellis, Remember rest in peace, yeah. right? He used to work uh, with the Ministry of Agriculture for many years, then retired. And... He was one of the founding members of the Cayo BTIA, the Belize Tourism Industry Association. And um, at the time, I was working at Pak Bitun with one of my, my professors. And he came up to me one day and said, this, I still remember, this is 1986. Okay. He says, Jaime, you need to go work at Calpech. The site is being destroyed. And it was by modern urban expansion. San Ignacio was growing, right. just like all of our towns and cities, right? right. And um, I remember saying to him, Mr. Ellis, I would love to do that, but it's not cheap to do an archaeological project. Right? You have to get funding. And I'm not going to get funding in Belize. You know, like you said, let's, you know, we got to be honest here, right? This is right. uncut. And, um, and I said, but tell you what, I'm going back to Canada, got to finish my master's, and I'm going to look to see if I can find any kind of funding opportunities for somebody without a PhD to try to come and preserve Cal Pitch. And I went. And I was able to get grants from the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. It was a small grant. It was about 20,000 Canadian dollars. But back then, that was a lot of money. Hey, guys, uh, could we find some footage of Jaime at Cal Pitch? I know that I've been there with him, but that was probably in 2010. Not sure you all have that on the digital archive, but please continue. So, so I got $20,000 Canadian. Now, that, like I said, that was a lot of money back then. Came down, and the first thing we did was we demarcated an area for the national park that became the National Reserve uh, Cal Pitch. Wow. Subsequent years... Right the, in the middle of San Ignacio. Yes, yeah. and luckily... You know, George Thompson, who works at the Institute, um, you know, and, and Brian Woodai, they were able to then acquire another five acres, I think, to add to that park. And, you know, I used to tell people that we'd be working at Cal Pitch, and we used to hear bulldozers. And whenever we hear the bulldozers, we would stop and run because we knew that they were opening a new, right, road access for housing to be developed around San Ignacio. I have pictures of uh, some of us standing in front of the bulldozer. Really? And wow. say, whoa, you, can, you know, mound. Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square style. Yes. Back in the 80s. Yeah, except, you know, they were doing it in front of tanks. Okay, we have the footage here of one of your digs at yes. Calpets. Yes, you know. Yeah. Um, and, Great work, um, guys. Uh -huh. And, you know, had we not done that, Calpets would have been mostly destroyed. Amazing. So, you know, often, you know, when, you know, eventually with the Institute of Archaeology, um, you know, we would target sites that were on the verge. Sir Pancho Mill. Okay, right. We got word that people were robbing much of the metal because we were selling metal to get right. shipped to Guatemala, I think. This is then, in silk grass. Yes. Outside. Because then they, you know, they, they melt them down and then they, they make. Wow. And... Um, 
you know, we were able to get a grant from the U.S. Ambassador's Fund. Okay. And that was what allowed us to save Sir Pun. Amazing. And, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, it was us sort of trying to, to beat that development. Um, roads, same sort of thing, you know, in case sometimes we've gone in. And now, thankfully, we have to do archaeological impact assessments. For if you want to build any road in Belize, or for most development, you need to have an archaeologist do an impact assessment, and we will say, look, there are you know features of archaeological significance that you must avoid. Now we need to do that more when these large land grants or land sales are made, and then you know the development is going to go in, or you know complete land clearing. Um, we, we need to do more of that. So, but with the, with the uh, perspective that history has given us, I, I know I was very involved in that Grijalva story, the Nomul story, and I have a clearer sense of the, of the dynamics that were at play then. But while he, I believe he was, I believe he was convicted. Yes, and fined. Yeah, but I'm saying that this only happened because he is a Belizean, or I know he's, uh, he, he's an immigrant, or he has immigrated and become naturalized, but it didn't happen to any Mennonite who did it because of the power dynamics at play. Many Mennonites, many others throughout this country have done what he did before. But he got dragged through the mill. His name will live on in infamy. And it's really an uneven application of the law. I think historically we can concede to that. Yeah, I think, you know, we, it's important that these kinds of destruction, you know, are litigated um, and litigated more often. Um, in the Grijalva case, you know, I think there it was quite obvious who was involved in the destruction. <clears throat> so there, you know, there was a, an individual that one could then pursue, yeah. you know, legally. In many cases, part of the problem is that, you know, we get the story after the fact. Right. And so you go in there and, um, you know, and you ask around. Nobody wants to divulge who was involved in the destruction. Um, you know, I remember a lot of times you, you know, you would hear somebody might get in touch with you, but they will do it anonymously because, again, they did not want to be brought in as you know, uh, to testify as witnesses. Um, and so we would get these anonymous calls and then you go up and you see it, but then you, we would go to villages and say, do you know who did this? Or if it even was a piece of land and the, the landowner would go, oh, I leased that piece of land. And then you go to the person who leased it. Well, um, you know, it was the bulldozer, you know, people that I hired. And it was always, it would just, you know, the, the buck would be passed. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I agree with you. We need to be more proactive in, in pursuing uh, legal action against you know, people who break the law. We'll take our first commercial with that. When we come back, it's story time with Jaime Awe. He'll do what he does best. He will spin the magical stories of, of the past based on the archaeological evidence that uh, has been uh, recently unearthed. We want to know what's happening with the latest digs. And we also want to talk about the Comcom vase. And we're going to talk about Maya land rights. Where Jaime know about that? Little known fact is that Dr. Jaime Awe was the principal expert for the government of Belize when, that, uh, when the Maya land rights case first went to the Supreme Court before Justice Abdullahi Conte. So he has some uh, valuable perspective on that, especially eight years later after the judgment and we're still fumbling towards who knows what. We'll talk about those big issues and story time with Jaime when we come back. Please stay tuned to Uncut. I can get what I need and save some money. 
After 75 years in the business Nobody, nobody, nobody do it like Dennis Hello, how may I help you? Anything you need, we got you Whether it's tools or tiles Lights and fans, we are serving with a smile Genuine plumbing and electric supply Quality construction supply Heating and air condition 100% Belizean Dennis, hey, celebrating 75 years Celebrating 75 years, quality and savings, quality and savings. ¿Sabías que Hospital Galenia modificó los protocolos de seguridad y prevención de salud ante la pandemia de COVID-19 para evitar contagios? Se garantiza que todo paciente que llega a quirófano está libre de COVID y durante su periodo de recuperación no va a tener contacto con un paciente infectado. Hospital Galenia, más que un hospital. Universal has all the tools you need for the perfect outdoor grilling. Visit Universal Hardware for a supply of top quality kitchen appliances. Perfect for indoor and outdoor dining and cookouts. Find us on Chetamal Boulevard in Belize City or Center Avenue in Spanish Lookout. Universal Hardware, the preferred solutions provider. Nando's Wholesale is your market leader in Belize's wholesale industry when it comes to high quality products at the most reasonable and competitive prices. With over 40 years in the wholesale business, Nando's Wholesale embraces the partnership of the hotel industry in Belize by providing world-renowned brands in wines, seasonings, condiments and cleaners in industrial sizes as well as small and large kitchen appliances and equipment. Nando's also takes pride in providing one of the quietest and most durable air conditioning systems in Belize with technical support and spare parts. Nando's Wholesale. Professional, reliable, effective, and prompt. Nando's Wholesale always delivers. Visit us at www.nandos.bz or send an email to admin at nandos.bz or better yet, give us a call today at 222-5000 or 280-8080 to speak to one of our sales representatives today. The government of Belize has been blazing a trail and delivering on every milestone of its tax reform program. Iris Belize was launched in 2021 and its second phase is here in 2022. It provides taxpayers and or their representatives with the ability to sign up for Iris Belize. You'll now be able to inquire, file, and pay online. This means that tax clients like you are able to sign up online and get access to individual and companies' tax accounts. No more long lines. Contactless, safe, from support, from the privacy and safety of your homes and offices. Hi, I'm Chef Sean Quillen. I love cooked fish fillet, and I prefer to get my fish straight at the fish market right here at Conseil Bay. But you see sometimes you come out here and you don't know what you're getting. The fish has no label, it has no patch of skin. But don't worry about it. I am here today to teach you how to avoid fish fraud. When purchasing your fillet, remember to look out for the patch of skin required by law. Or you could tell them by the physical characteristics. Long and slender, barracuda. Nice white meat, hard fish. The deep bloodline from the bow to the stand that is jack. When buying in bulk or buying out of a bag, make sure to inspect each fillet individually to avoid what we call in a Creole, pussy in a bag. What a pussy in a bag? Mr. <laughs> Fraud. If that not to help you, because even for me as a professional chef at this man for 40 years, that's really challenging. All I could tell you is buy from a reputable source or buy it whole. And if all of that is not available to you, just go to fishrighteatright.com 
and we at Oceana have a fish identification charge. Because guess where you're going now? We talk about bloodline just now and thing. And that's a snapper, right? Classic snapper. What kind of snapper this? This is the shark. Nurse shark. Highly illegal. No make the trick you, no make your buy pussy in a bag. Do the right thing. Fish right, eat right. 65 years ago, Don Nomario started with one bar and a vision to capture the taste of Belize and share it with the world. Realizing that this vision would not be easy, the Perdomo family pulled together and rose to the challenge. In 1995, they became the first exporters of fine Belizean rum. 65 years later, with the oldest distillery in the country, their drive for excellence is as strong as ever, gaining them recognition and awards from around the world. But more than that, their core family values and pride in Belize keeps them giving back. The challenges were many, but the compromises were none. In the pursuit of great taste, Traveler's Liquors has shown the taste of success is sweet indeed. Run them jewels fast, run them, run them jewels fast, run them, 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 run Welcome back to Uncut, where we're joined by Dr. Jaime Awe, who's come down all the way from his home in Cayo, um, his summer home, as it is now. Um, Jaime, we have in front of us uh, some of the, uh, some molds of some of the eccentric flints that were found at Sunantonich in the ongoing dig. First of all, give us some context. Put us at Sunantonich. What's happening right now? What are you doing? What are you looking for? What have you found? So, um, you know, our ongoing work at Chinantanich combines research with conservation. And in 2018, 2019, we decided to do some conservation on ball court two. This is a small ball court that was identified some years ago. And we decided to place some excavations down in the center of what we call the playing alley of the ball court. Okay, and we have a picture of that. <clears throat> yes, um, we do. Just, just hand it to me. Um, um, yeah, let me just uh, show you. The... Jaime is old school, so he brought the pictures printed. <laughs> so uh, let me just show it. So this is the area you're talking about, right? Yes. This is the area of the ball court, and you can see some of the excavation units that we placed in the playing alley of the, of the ball court. Okay, I see, okay. Yeah. And, you know, we know that, you know, the, the Maya would often put offerings at the center of the ball court and also at the ends. And we thought, well, you know, we knew that, you know, Thomas Gann, Eric Thompson, and, you know, th there's been work done at Chinatonich for over 100 years. And I felt that for sure somebody would have excavated in those areas. Well. I didn't want to leave anything to chance, so we still placed some of the excavations, and we started to find several of these offerings that we call caches. And in them, they had these flints. We call them eccentric flints. Okay, so those and are the flints that are on this table before me, right? So these are some examples of what the originals look like. These are not yeah. the artifacts. We didn't bring the artifacts, folks. So Not like the time that me and Jaime went to the Belize Bank took the jade head out That's right. and, and started to, uh, we took it to the museum That's right. where I kissed it. Yes, I remember that very vividly. Well, you know, the, the Institute of Archaeology had given me permission to try to make duplicates of them. And so I have a colleague who specializes in this kind of stuff. And these are all replicas. In fact, if you hit two of them, yeah, they're it's, plastic. it's plastic, right? But they look like the original, same so, color and everything. So what are these? What's the story of these objects? So the, the reason for doing this is that 
The Institute of Archaeology sometimes does traveling exhibitions where they take objects at schools in, right. from Corozal to Toledo and back and forth. And the idea is that rather than take original artifacts or even in visitor centers like the visitor center at Chinantanich, if we can do this, then they can place those in those visitor centers. So if anyone ever breaks in and they steal these, yeah. they're plastic. You know. What was the original intent and use of these objects? <clears throat> what, what does their so the, the design Ma say? The Maya made these things to go specifically as offerings to some of their deities. And uh, we know that ball courts are closely related to underworld ideas and themes. And many of these, you know, Flint is the firestone. The firestone is, you know, we still believe that when there's lightning, there's a thunderbolt. In fact, when people find the axe heads in their land, they go, the one thunderbolt. Right. And so we find a lot of these flints in there. It has associations with water, right? Especially during times of drought. Um, some of them look like centipedes. We have some that look like snakes or serpents. Some of them look like scorpions. These are all, you know, snakes are associated with rain um, as well. So these would have been made by artisans oh, yes. at the time. Yes. And these, what we are seeing here, are reverential offerings. Yes. And for a purpose. Yes. Yeah. No, is there, what, what is the, what uh, are the dates on the original object? So these date somewhere between, uh, anywhere around 800 AD, plus or minus a few years. <clears throat> yeah. Now, like I said, right, Remember I was saying, you know, education is really important. So in the visitor center at Chinantinich, we, you know, we created this poster that has a lot of these images and will have the information. And then they can also see these replicas in the visitor center. Now, <clears throat> another really interesting thing that, um, you know, I have just talked briefly with uh, Dr. Badillo and that we'll be talking some more about is using QR codes. I don't know if you're, yeah. you know. In fact, a lot of our restaurants in Belize now, when you go yeah, in, you scan the code. You take your, your smartphone um, and you scan the code. And then now you can look at the menu and you can look at other things, etc. Right. So <clears throat> one of the things that we want to do is to provide right, the tour guides or at the, at the entrance to the archaeological sites, to, uh, QR codes, so that let's say you arrive with your family and you can then have these codes that you can photograph and then you go to the ball court and you can then you know, get on, on that, right. right, the link, and then you will see these images and you can, you know, with some write-up, you know, we right. excavated here, this is what we found. This, and right. I mean, today, all kids have smartphones. Right. So and, the site comes to life. <clears throat> Yes, the site comes totally to life, and it's at your speed. Right. Um, there, you know, if you get to the temple where we found the hieroglyphic panels... I that think that was the one we did in 2016. 2016. Lance, do we have that footage? Uh, when we went to uh, the San Antonich Mysteries Revealed? Yes. Yeah, so there it is, yeah. Right, so, you know, today... I could, you know, I could probably put up a big sign there that would cover part of the building describing the significance of those right. panels and also of the tomb that we found there and as, uh, of the offerings. Now, if you have a QR code and you hit yeah. the link, you can stand there. We have put replicas, by the way, of the original uh, right. panels and we moved the originals in the visitor center for protection. But with that QR code, then you can go, all right, this is what these panels tell us that we found this tomb. And by the way, we were able to do some DNA on the person in that tomb, and it's a woman. Really? Wow. Initially, we thought it was a male. We now know 100% it was a woman. So uh, do we have footage of that tomb, guys? I think one of the stories had it, but, but um, what's the significance of that? That's unusual. Yes. It, it, why, would, why would she have been in so, there? <clears throat> it is both unusual, but not necessarily you know, totally rare or, yeah. you know, that we don't have evidence. What we have been finding out is that at many of the Maya cities, there were very accomplished women. I'll give you an example. 
<clears throat> there is this really famous Maya queen. Um, in fact, uh, she was the, you know, her husband dies mm -hmm. and her son is only five years old. So she then becomes the, so, so the ruler until right. her son comes of age. Right. In the city of, it's like of a, a regent. I think yes. It's called. Yeah. And under her control or under her sort of governance, Naranjo expands and, you know, and takes over other cities and becomes really a major center in that part of Guatemala. Well, we now have our own queen of Shenantanich, wow. who also, you know, we know that she may have participated as an ally of Naranjo in wars with other cities. So it helps us to weave a more accurate story um, of the ancient Maya and of some of their accomplishments. And by, like I said, by having the QR code for many of our sites, it will allow the Institute they, of... they, We have the, the yes. remains right there. Right. Yeah. So, it, you know, so we can... We... So that's a woman. We can say that's the queen of San Antonio right there. Yes. You know, or, or at least for that period of time. Right, right, right. But we can import a lot of the images that, you know, we, the archaeologists, take of some of the discoveries and then provide them, right, to the visitors. Or like when these cool groups go to the sites, then their teacher who's there with them. And she was adorned them. with some jade or something? Oh, yes, she had jade jewelry. There were, you know, several other objects inside the tomb. Had 38 whole vessels. They got smashed because the roof collapsed. Now, what is the overall, <laughs> what's the evolving thinking on Sun Antonich in terms of the importance of the site or the activities that were happening at the site with these latest finds, especially in the ball court? Well, it... it it shows, and I think it provides good evidence, that Shinantanich was definitely a major capital in what we call the terminal classic period, that period of about 800 to 900 AD. Um, and as we are gathering more information, what we're seeing is, because in the past, you know, some uh, previous archaeologists had suggested that Whatever Shinantanich did, it did under the rulership of somebody that was placed there from Naranjo. Because we've now done DNA and strontium isotope analysis, we know that, one, that this is a woman, but secondly, that she's local. She's not some imported queen. They're not sitting from Naranjo. No, she is local. Kayo Gel. Precisely. And Kayo Gel. Precisely. And, and, and so it, it allows us to provide a more accurate right, story about what unfolded at, at places like Shenantanich. Now, speak about what's the latest that uh, you're doing at Kahalpech. And Kahalpech, as you heard Jaime explain earlier, is a site he's been working at since 1986. 88. 88. Yeah. I met with Gads in 86, in 86. And he said, right. you need to come here. And I got the grant later on and then started in 88. So what is the evolving uh, uh, storyline or understanding of Cajalpech in the constellation of Maya cities around that area, which was quite dense, obviously, Caracol being the super city? Well, you know, the, the advantage of doing regional studies, you know, often we focus most of our attention on one site. Well, that's good. Nothing wrong with that. But at the end, you have a small window into the yeah. regional past, right? You're seeing the world through a straw. Yes, and you might be only looking at Cal Pitch. By being able to have a regional approach where we're working at Cal Pitch, we're looking at Chinantanich, at Baking Pot, and other places in between, it now allows us to look at this region. It's like if you want to learn about Belize, but you only come to Belize City, and you don't go to Punta Gorda, or you don't go to Corozal or San Ignacio, you know, your, your perspective on Belize is going to be limited. Right. And one of the things that it's allowing us to do is we're, it allows us to look at interactions between these city-states. And in some cases, those interactions were good. There were alliances. But in some cases, those alliances, those, those um, relationships were not that great. Right? And in some cases, these city-states were at odds with each other which translates to martial activity, warfare between each other. Um, and, 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 you know, we're, we're starting to learn more, and we're looking at Kyle Pitch 
what happens around the time of uh, um, before abandonment. Um, and we're learning a lot more that as these, these cities didn't, it wasn't like overnight, you know, everybody packed up and left. Right. It was gradual. Some people stayed back. Some people kept going to the site and doing rituals, um, hoping that things were going to improve. Right. We now believe that drought was one of the major, not the only factor, but one of the major factors that brings about the decline of Maya civilization. Um, and how did it affect, you know, Kahalpech? Was it similar to how it affected Chinantanich or Baking Pot or Lamanai or Karakol? And so we're starting to see this bigger picture at play. You know, it's like, you know, when a hurricane, if you look at the disaster, right, it might affect maybe Belize City. If it hits Belize City and it comes through here, more so than it, than it will Dangriga or Punta Gorda. And so we're, we're, we're starting to, to really get a better sense of what's happening. Speak to me about Baking Pot because I haven't, uh, I ha haven't been with you there. What's the significance of Baking Pot and why are you doing research there? So I am starting to do the long goodbye to Cajal Pech. Right. Like I've been there forever. Did my PhD thesis research on Calpech, and we're still there. Yeah. Um, and the same with Chinantanich. You know, I've been there. I, I, you know, I remember thinking I'd never go work at Chinantanich. Then I did four years, then I did TDP, and then I went back in 2015, and this is what, seven years But later. you keep finding stuff. That's right. I mean, you, you know, it was, two years ago, it was that very exciting queen of St. Antonich. Yes. And now uh, you're finding all this stuff so we find at the ball court. five offerings in the ball court, over yeah. 120 of these eccentrics. Right. And, you know, so, so yeah. Um, and it's amazing how much is there when you think of how many archaeologists and looters, yeah. or archaeologists slash looters, I won't go, I, I didn't say gun, but, um, you know, I, when, when you think of all the work that has been done there, illicit and illicit, and it still has mysteries oh, yes. that, are, that are being un, unfolded. Yeah. yeah. But so, yeah, so the long goodbye. Part, <clears throat> yes. So, you know, the long goodbye. So we're starting to focus more energies over at uh, Baking Pot. What's and the significance of Baking Pot? So there, there are a couple... For people who don't know, where is Baking Pot? So Baking Pot is by Central Farm on the road going to, to Spanish Accord, where you take the ferry. Right, we're taking so the ferry. It's, it's that will take you across the Spanish Yeah, Coast. it's in government. So it's by Central Farm. You're cut off on the right by the airstrip. Yes, it's yeah. government property. And um, yeah. we know that, you know, one, we, we have different goals at Baking Pot, but one of the ultimate goals is that we can now develop that site also to conserve it, right? And again, for education purposes, for tourism purposes, for a variety of different purposes. And, um, and so we began to, like I said, focus more energies there. And having worked at several sites all over the country, we know that during the time of abandonment, there are, they are placing, people are going back to these sacred places and doing ceremonies and rituals and leaving deposits in certain locations. And we were excavating in some of these locations when we came across the Kum Kum vase. Okay. And as you pointed out, I mean, the Kum Kum vase is unique. Right. It has the longest hieroglyphic text in the country of Belize, over 202 glyph blocks. Right, so, so we're looking at it there. And that's when we were starting to find the fragments. We've, we, it's 60% complete. So we're hoping to find the other 40% that's missing. And that, that vase, like I, from, from the, the documentary and what we're looking at, folks, is a footage of a, a very successful uh, PBS Nova, Nova documentary yeah. uh, on, the, on the Com Com vase and other work that Jaime has been doing. But um, the Com Com vase is, is sort of, Jaime, like an a ancient or a, a microchip of antiquity. Yes. In terms of uh, it's such a vast repository of data. What story does it tell? Well, what's amazing about it, it tells us about some of the events that unfolded just around this time, like I said, uh, just before and during the time of the decline uh, of the civilization. One of the, the things that's different about the Kom Kom vase, 
often when we find inscriptions, it tells you, you know, events. It talks, they talk about events that happened 100 years ago, 200 years apart. The Komkom vase, it's almost like a newspaper. You know, we call them codex-style right. vessels. Codex meaning like literature, right? It's written information. And it talks about events that took place within days, within weeks of each other. Not, you know, this ruler came to power, you know, 200 years ago. and blah, blah, blah. No, it's like concurrent events. And it talks about some of the conflicts between some of these cities around this time wow. of the decline. Um, and it, it's one of the 10 longest hieroglyphic texts in the Maya world. Wow. And we found it here in Belize. Amazing. So, it, you know, it, it's world famous. Um, you know, it, it made headlines all, all over the world. And uh, we have a you know, reason to be proud of the fact that it was found in Belize. What is the useful knowledge that has been gained? We can see it there, uh, partially reconstructed, very yes. beautiful image. What is the, uh, you know, apart from these, these rivalries, what is the useful knowledge that has been gained about information, the importance of, of information as currency? So it identified several players that were involved, you know, against each other and with each other. Wow. It identifies several places that we didn't know about or at least gives them names. So we can now start to talk about places using the ancient names that the Maya had for them. And it's telling us about the different events, the sort of the, the geopolitics, if you want. Right. And, I mean, today we have so much geopolitics. We look what's right. happening in the Ukraine right. and Russia and what America is doing and yeah. right, the, the, the members of, of NATO and the European Union. So if we want to think of it like that, you know, it's, it's a good way to think about it. And no other Maya inscription has ever done that for us. So it's like war and rumors of war, as they say. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, and so now, Jaime, explain if you can, um, you know, where this fits in, in terms of the, the kind of interest that it has generated worldwide, because I know the, the, the documentary was also cut for Europe. Yes. And it's been very well received over there as yes. well. Yes, and in fact, the European... This is the same documentary you're seeing now. Yeah, but the That's Euro a 3D uh, reenactment. The European version is even longer. Really? Okay. Yes. Because this version is 48 minutes, I think. Yeah, well, well, you know, Nova in the American system, they have to have enough time in there for those commercials. Okay. You know, that's what pays right. for the documentary. The European version, it's longer because it's partly funded by other grants. So it's not as commercial in that sense. Okay. Yeah. Now, is this, um, you know, when, when you look at this, this work that you're doing at those sites in Cayo, in the Cayo district, but there are ongoing projects throughout Belize. I, I don't imagine you would be as in touch as you were when you were the commissioner of archaeology or the head of the Institute of Archaeology. But... What other exciting uh, projects do you know that are going on across the country? Several, and that's the beauty of the... Archaeological Belize... Symposium. Yeah. Take us there. That's right. That's the beauty of the Archaeology Symposium. And, you know, we were all really glad that, you know, that the Institute was able to, you know, again, to, to bring it back after the pandemic. Um, some of the amazing work that's being done, I'll get, let me give you an example, is happening right now in the south, in Toledo district. Okay. Um, one of our colleagues, uh, Keith Poofer from University of New Mexico, and his team, both of Belizeans and foreigners, have been working at some rock shelters in southern Belize. And they have found evidence going back to about 10,000 BC, right up onto about 900 AD. I mean, Talk about a long history of activity. They have also found several right, skeletal remains in those deposits. And it has completely changed our perspective on the early immigrants into this area and the development of agriculture. Let me explain. 
we, you know, it, it's, it's an accepted, you know, fact that all Native Americans, doesn't matter if they're from Alaska, Canada, pick a spot in the U.S., Mexico, Central America, all the way down south to Tierra del Fuego, are descendants of groups that came through the Bering Straits, through Siberia and then over to Alaska when there was a land bridge. And eventually there was the diaspora. But we always had this more simplified perspective on how that diaspora worked. And it was like a one-way street. They came from the north and headed south. And that was it. Well, DNA studies of the remains of these early people in Toledo from some of these rock shelters indicates that people may have gone along the Pacific or up through the mountains to South America, but eventually some of them come back. And they come back from lower Central America into Belize, and they're the ones that introduced corn agriculture. Before, we used to think, oh, no, it had to come from the north, from Mexico. It's like, you know, we had this assumption that it was, like I said, there was a one-way sign that says, go south. Right. Well, we're seeing that it's more complex than that, right? That some people may have gone south, but then eventually, you know, some changes, some of them come back up north. And those are the people that eventually move into southern Belize with corn agriculture. And corn agriculture is fully ad uh, uh, adopted by about 2000 BC, maybe even earlier, right up to about 3000 mm -hmm. BC. Before, we thought that didn't happen until about 1000. And the BC. importance of corn agriculture is critical because we would not have had civilization without corn agriculture. It's like, if you look at every major civilization, think of Asian civilizations without rice. You have to be able to produce surpluses that then allow people like you to become a specialist in the work that you do, right. people like me to become a specialist in the work that I do. Because farmers can produce enough surplus that not all of us have to be out there looking for food. So without major staples, and especially right, grains like rice, like corn, like wheat, if you're in Europe, we probably would have been hunters and gatherers for the rest of our lives. But agriculture allowed us to then become settled, living in one place. And there's some bad things about agriculture too, right? Of course. It increased diseases and, you know, people then... Also, people's diets sometimes were not as good because they were relying more and more on just a right. few, you know, plants and animals. But the arrival of corn as a crop much earlier into Belize, what did that, uh, what, what, how does that change the perspective on the development of civilizations in Belize from an earlier time? It, it's, it's pushing the dates back. You know, um, for, for some time, people used to think, oh, you know, the development of civilization in Belize, in places like Belize, were much later than in Mexico or in Guatemala because, you know, we didn't have any evidence for established agriculture before 1000 BC. Well, this new research that's taking place in Toledo is saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Corn agriculture may have actually started in some places like Belize, in the tropics, rather than outside. Um, and thankfully, because preservation is so good in rock shelters, it's allowing us to see some of these events. And with that critical point, we take our commercial break. Why is it critical? Because that starts to talk about who was in southern Belize from the time of prehistory, and who is there now, and what sort of land rights are associated with that. Jaime Awe, Dr. Jaime was a, a expert witness that went to the Supreme Court on behalf of the government and he made certain assertions and we'll ask him about that and his perspective on the ongoing Maya land rights. Uh, it's now a struggle that has ensued. And so we'll talk about that controversial issue and we'll leave it by niche after the commercial break. Stay tuned for a last break. We'll be right back with Dr. Jaime Awe.
We all know the importance of running water and proper drainage in your home. That's why we rely on a fully functional plumbing system. At Benny's, we have all the plumbing supplies and accessories you need. Our pipes, fittings, valves and adapters are made from durable quality materials. Remember to wash your hands with clean running water from your faucet. We have kitchen and bathroom faucets in various styles and finishes. Whether for installation or maintenance, make sure to use recommended PVC cleaner, solvent and Teflon tape to fix or prevent leaks. We also have the tools to get the job done. For all your residential, commercial or industrial plumbing needs, shop at Benny's. Celebrating 75 years of quality and savings. ¿Sabías que Hospital Galenia modificó los protocolos de seguridad y prevención de salud ante la pandemia de COVID-19 para evitar contagios? Se garantiza que todo paciente que llega a quirófano está libre de COVID y durante su periodo de recuperación no va a tener contacto con un paciente infectado. Hospital Galenia, más que un hospital. We were born connected to the water, the deep blue, the soil, the salt air, sheer abundance, ritual, water, expectation of the catch, the wind and waves. What lay beneath filled our bellies, sustained our communities. But song fell to a whisper. Her rituals were lost. Communities changed. But now, that song beckons us back to the sea. The generations that came before, and for the generations still to come, thriving abundant sea is possible. Rebuilding fish populations can be our legacy. Universal has all the tools you need for the perfect outdoor grilling. Visit Universal Hardware for a supply of top quality kitchen appliances. Perfect for indoor and outdoor dining and cookouts. Find us on Chetamal Boulevard in Belize City or Center Avenue in Spanish Lookout. Universal Hardware, the preferred solutions provider. is the distributor for the full line of Badia spices, including the original complete seasoning, the perfect combination of ingredients and spices prepared to enhance the natural flavor of your favorite foods. Also, cinnamon powder for all your desserts, fruits and beverages, and as special dishes. All these are available in commercial sizes or restaurant packaging. Nando's products are available at your local retailer or contact us at 222-5000. From Corzal to Toledo, Nando's is proud to be serving Belize as its number one wholesale distributor for over 35 years. Why you want to go at G? Why you want to learn to live the good life? I noticed, I noticed, look like you're at a big time resort there. Why you want something like that? Vice from the comfort of your backyard with fantastic discounts on pools, beach accessories, and more. Only at Benny's. Wait, why you get all the thing in your backyard at Benny's? Why look like I forgot shop at Benny's today? Celebrating 75 years of quality and savings. Run them jewels fast, run them, run them jewels fast, run them, 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 run them
Welcome back to Uncut with Dr. Jaime Awe. We'll pick up where we left off. Jaime, you were talking about some of the exciting new finds uh, in southern Belize that show that uh, human habitation and cultivation of maize in that area started as early as 2000 BC. Yeah. So there has been, or there had been uninterrupted indigenous occupation there for many centuries. However, at some point, um, the history as you know and understand it, is that it was abandoned. Uh, a lot of the, the, the principal cities and sites there were abandoned because we know there, were envi there was environmental issues, there was drought, uh, and the land was not productive anymore. So, the Mayas who called the Toledo district home now, are those the people, or are they descendants of the people who were there uh, a millennia ago, a millennium ago? What is your understanding on this? All right, so <clears throat> I think, you know, to, to sort of contextualize it, right, to, to, to paint the, the, the picture, as, as you pointed out, <clears throat> our studies not just in Toledo, but, you know, Cayo District, Dan Creek District, all the way up to Corozal. We know that sometime between 900 and 1000 AD, many of these cities are abandoned. And we know that because, uh, you know, the, the research that we do shows continuous occupation and then there's a break in that occupation. And these cities are abandoned, the buildings start to collapse and fall apart because if they had been continuously <clears throat> occupied, we would have found evidence. In fact, the Spanish would have written about, you know, contacting people at some of these cities or the British. And we, we don't have that. But there's a break in the archaeological record. So we right. know that there are, the, the sites are abandoned. And in addition to that, we know that eventually there is some reoccupation to some degree. But that reoccupation in some areas is ephemeral. In, in other words, what I mean by ephemeral, it's not like they go back to the population levels that they had around 900 AD. Now, what happens is that Europeans then come in shortly thereafter. Let's use the case of Toledo. There are historic reports from the Spanish where they were captured in that area or that they traveled from Guatemala up towards Belize, you know, up, up to, they were going up towards the Yucatan and they stop at some villages that were Chol villages. Okay. Like I said, this is not Explain me. Explain the Chol. So the Chol is a group of Maya. We know that the Chol during the heyday of the Maya, ancient Maya, the Chol occupied, if you were to look at the, the map of, of, of uh, the Maya region, right? You have the Gulf of Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, and it goes down like that. The Chol occupied that sort of base of the peninsula okay. that extends from the Tabasco area to about parts of Chiapas, right down through parts of Guatemala and southern Belize. Okay. Uh, so that area. To the north, you have the Yucatec okay. Maya. And then to the south, you had Chol, Chorti, etc., and, and several other, right? Canjobal, Kekchi. Um, there are 31 different Maya groups. Right? They're not just one group. And I keep using the word Maya, but, you know, we, let me just quickly say this, and I'll come back to this. Um, these people never refer to themselves as Maya. Right? That's a term that has been given to them as a blanket. You know, it's like we say we're all Belizean, right? right? But we know that we have Belizeans of different ethnicity. But like I said, let's come back to that and go back to the history. So we also know that, so when the Spanish reports, they refer to the Chol in Toledo district. In the hieroglyphic inscriptions. What, those, what, and those Spanish reports date back to what time? To the, you know, to the 1700s. Right. Um, 
And we also, sorry, and even earlier, the, the 1600s, um, the, the, we also know that the Spanish eventually forcibly removed Right, Maya people who were living in different, you know, in some parts of Belize. In the case of Toledo, they moved the Chol and they moved them over into Guatemala. And why? Because they wanted to use these people as forced labor in some of their encomiendas. The, the Spanish created these encomiendas. It's like gifts of land to some of the Spaniards. And the Spanish who got these, they wanted people to work the land for them. And so they forcibly removed the Maya to some places. Now, I'll give you another example of that. We know that there was a place called Tipu. Tipu was a community in San, in just south of San Ignacio, up the Macal River. About, as the crow flies, about five miles south of San Ignacio. Now, the Maya who inhabited Tipu were mostly Itza Maya. They were not original to that area. They come in escaping the Spanish. In fact, Tipu was one of those places that if you were escaping the Spanish from the Yucatan, you would head there. Right? So they were rebellious Maya. Maroon community. Yes. The Maya e eventually, we know that the Spanish destroy or defeat the Itza at Ta Itza, the capital, which is modern day Flores Petén in 1697. And then what they do after that, they forcibly remove the Maya, not just from Taitza, but also from Tipu in Western Belize. And they move them into Guatemala to some of these encomiendas. Now, <clears throat> eventually, we, you know, during the caste wars, which is in the 1850s, we know that a group of Yucatecan speakers, or Yucatecan Maya, start to fight against the Mexicans, but also they're revolting against sure. you know, parts of Guatemala. Right. And, um, and the, during the caste wars, a lot of them come into northern Belize, but it's also around this time that they come into San Jose Socots and also to San Antonio in Cayo. Well, we also have a branch of Itza, which is Mopan. And the Mopan folk come in from Guatemala into the San Antonio Toledo area, etc. Now, in terms of the Kekchi, there are archival records right, that we know that this German by the last name of Kramer had applied for a grant, uh, per, sorry, for permission from the British colonial government to, <clears throat> pardon me, to establish a coffee plantation in Western Toledo. And Kramer comes in, but there are no people to hire, right? And the Garifuna on the coast, you know, did not want to move from the coast. So he requests from the colonial government permission to bring groups from Alta Verapaz, from the greater Verapaz region, mostly Kekchis, into that region. And like I said, there's archival record to, to that effect. And um, this is around 1890 and, and the early 1900s. And like I said, there, there are records of, of this happening. Now, you know, Belize has been a place of, for refugees. My grandparents, none of my grandparents were born in Belize. Both my parents were. If you ask most Belizeans, you know, how far back can you go um, many of us have relatives that come from, my, one of my grandmothers came from Guatemala. Right. Um, one came from, you know, two of them came from Mexico. <clears throat> um, again, you know, escaping revolution. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but, and that's the story of Belize. So in, I can't remember 2000 what, you know, because I was head of archaeology um, and, and head of the institute, government asked me right to provide some kind of historical the same thing i just gave you about you know the indigenous you were the groups. principal expert <clears throat> witness on behalf of, of government the, of the government i yes. was hired by government so right. <clears throat> they asked me to give them you know and you attested in court that i didn't my... go to court actually 
Oh, you did an uh, affidavit. Yeah, I, I did this affidavit that, you know, government had asked me to do. And the affidavit, to, to, to sum it up, stated that the Mayas who are in Belize today right. are immigrants, just, just like anyone else. Just like the Maya in San, um, in, um, in San Pedro or Ambergris right. Key. You know, right. um, um, yeah. Who came down in a caste war. Yes. Right. You know, and uh, so, you know, my, my job or the request made to government, for, you know, for me was to provide them with sort of this historical sketch of, right, groups that migrated into Belize. Specifically and so, my occupation in the Toledo district. Of course, you know, because and that was... Your, your, your understanding was that, that it was not uninterrupted... Maya occupation of the yeah. Toledo district. Yes, because it was interrupted. And the data is the data, you know. It's, um, and, you know, I've always said, you know, we can't rewrite, the, we, we can't change the past to fit the present. Right. It is what it is. So then the argument, extending that, that conclusion, the argument then would be that if you are an immigrant, you do not have pre-conquest or uh, uh, pre-colonial land right claims because you too are an immigrant. From that point of view, yes. You know. <clears throat> now, what's unfortunate about that, though, is that you know the and, and my you know my, my position was not to argue that. My position was to provide uh, right. right an a, a, a researched explanation for what the historical record informed us. Um, what is sad about that is that, you know, we're, we're all native Belizeans. And I like to think of us as, as all Belizeans, you know, whether, you know, we're from European heritage or if you're from, you know, Middle Eastern heritage or Central American heritage or Maya heritage or Mesoamerican heritage. You know, we're, we're Belizeans and... Um, and I think we should all have certain certain rights. Um, but that that the argument will be made. I, I take the other side of it now. That this uh, this sort of you are not looking at the fact that all the political boundaries that define Belize are defined by settlers before all these European <clears throat> settlers came, yeah. before these col colonial administrators came. There were people here, and the people were Maya. And so, whether you, 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 you're splitting hairs, the argument will be made yeah. that it's Chol Maya, Keche Maya. These, these are Maya lands. And the Europeans came and carved it up and said, this is for you, this is for me, when they had no pre-existing authority or divine right to do so. Oh, it totally is a case of splitting hairs. You know, I agree with you on, on, on that point, you know, and I've always agreed on, on that point that um, it depends on, on your perspective. And one of those perspectives, like I said before, is to say, well, <clears throat> what do we mean by Maya? You know, who, who invented the term Maya? Um, it's you guys. It's <clears throat> the anthropologists. It's the Western gaze. Yeah. And, you know, if we were to go back in time. G-S-E-E, guys. <laughs> the Western G is E. Yeah. Uh huh. Continue. Um, you know, if we go back in time, you know, the people that we refer to as Maya back then certainly did not perceive of themselves as one united in you know Maya group. You know, their identity was linguistic first, second to their city state, and so if let's say if you were um, you know, if you spoke um, Kanhobal, you were Kanhobalan. And where was the homeland of the Kanhobal Maya people? Well, we know that's a highland Maya group. Um, and that's the region that, you know, they occupied. And so for Belize, we know that the southern part of the country, we don't know exactly how far, whether it moved all the way up to the Sabun, were Chol. The hieroglyphic inscriptions are written in Cholan for that area. So, if that area had been, let's say, um, Tsutsuhil, 
then one would have expected to some degree that some of the texts would have been in Sotsuhil. Now, having said that, we know that the, you know, often writings are done in the lingua franca or the, the, you know, the groups of people sometimes will choose what language they will use to write all kinds of stuff. At one time, for instance, Latin right. Was, right, was the universal language. Um, but in terms of you know, who was there, when, et cetera, it, it's, you know, but, it's a challenge. But then the other side of the argument is that if these specific, if we say they are Cholmaya, or that's what the historic record indicates, mm -hmm. then they do <clears throat> not qualify for indigenous title. That's the logical conclusion of that, of that historical from, data. Yeah, and, and from a legalistic point of view, you know, that argument uh, you know, can be made. No question about that. You know. How now, do you come down <clears throat> on the issue after all these years? Yeah, so you know, I've always been, again, I, I have a, my professional you know, opinion in terms of the history and the interrupted occupation and who was occupying there. Um, I think that's important. Like I said, you can't change the past to make it fit the present. And so one has to, you know, as a professional, I try to look at the evidence and what the evidence tells me. Now, if we look at the issue, that is more of a political issue. Mm. And I've always tried to stay away from the politics. Um, but, you know... It, in, in the sense that, you, you know, it's, it's very political. And, you know, one can also but argue... But everything is political, I mean. To, to I mean, in terms of... I don't, I don't mean purely be political. Yeah. I mean, having to do with, with, with the dynamics of power between different groups. Yeah. And anthropology engenders that. Archaeology engenders that. Oh, without, without doubt, you know. In fact, a lot of different disciplines, they'll tend to yeah. want to create, yeah. you know, greater differences or, you know, try to define things, you know, very narrowly. Um, you know, what, what should be done about this? Um, you know, my, my own personal opinion is that, you know, how can Belizeans, like, come to some kind of conclusion? Now, we know that the, 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 the British government, for instance, created um, some of these reservations when the, they were down there. Now, I also, you know, from, again, from a personal point of view, and even, you know, from a professional point of view, I think that, that was wrong, you know. Why was it that the that the British created those reservations? Now, did they do the same kinds of things in other parts of Belize? It doesn't seem to have been the case in Northern Belize, right? Right. No reservations were created in Northern Belize, right? For the Kaswa refugees, and and why not? You know, um, and is it possible that had that not been done in the South, that we would be faced with some of these right challenges today? Um, where perhaps some of the, the Maya in Toledo have felt disenfranchised, right? That they were in many ways, you know, abused by the, the, the colonial government. And, um, you know, how do you try to address some of those things? Um, no, I'm not saying that that was the case, but that's one perspective. Let's talk about another disenfranchised group, the Creoles, because yeah. they are <clears throat> the, you have argued, they have the longest uninterrupted occupation in Belize, dating back to the 1700s, when they first, uh, when Africans were first brought over as slaves in the logwood industry. Yeah. And they are the forestocracy, and the demise of the forest forestocracy after uh, after they depleted all the resources and there was no longer interest in mahogany for dye. Yeah. It could be created synthetically in, um, in Mother England. That these are the persons who have, A, had the longest uninterrupted occupation, and B, been the most disenfranchised, because when that <clears throat> aristocracy collapsed, they just dash everybody in at the same swamp we're probably there right now with all this crime, right? Why do we have all this crime? Because they were never able to develop a structured society because after aristocracy they were given nothing. Yeah. Uno got a port. 
They need uh, 20 Steve Adora No, then they try to take away even the port. That is another argument. But I'm saying speak about your perspective on the Creole's occupation in Belize, that uninterrupted occupation. Yeah. So when I was teaching at Galen, I remember once, um, you know, I, I looked around the classroom and like in any classroom in Belize, the diversity, the ethnic diversity is, is really incredible. And I think, you know, sometimes we Belizeans take it for granted. Well, in that one class, I, you know, I, I said, let's, I want to ask a question. Um, how far back can you go in terms of your relatives, your ancestors being born in Belize? And I said, I'm going to start. And I go, I can go back two generations. I banya and my parents banya, as we say in Creole. But none of my grandparents were born in Belize. So then I, you know, I ask another young woman who was from, um, she was Maya from San Jose Socots. And uh, she said, well, her grandfather, her, her, I think her grandfather or great grandfather, her grandfather and grandmother were born in Belize. But her great grandparents came around the time of the caste wars into, into Belize. So they went back to either three or four generations. Right. And I had a student from, from, I had three students from Southern Belize. One was Garifuna. And we know when the Garifuna started to move into, into Southern Belize. So he could go back like, I think, two generations. Okay. And, um, and then I had a couple of Creole students. And one of them said, huh, my great-great-grandpa, me banya. And when we, if you, if you do the, the, the science, right, and you start to look at it, Creoles can go back more generations than almost most Belizeans can go back in terms of, right, from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. And we know that they're here from the 1700s. Okay. The caste wars is the 1850s. So the, you know, the Yucatec Maya that come in, that go to San Pedro, that end up in Orange Walk, that end up in Corozal, some in Cayo, you know, that 1850 time period is when they start to come in. Whereas, Yet the Creoles are the most dispossessed. Yeah. So again, you know, and, and like you pointed out, you know, to some, uh, <clears throat> to a large degree, we see that disenfranchisement there as well. Now, we know that there's been some diasporas of Creoles, right? I'm not talking, the, you know, the ones that went to the United States or to Canada, or, or et cetera. But we have some that moved to the West in Cayo. We have, Where? you know, and, and probably because... Have some in Liberty. Up, <clears throat> yes, and up the Belize River. Right, of course. In fact, some of the oldest Creole communities are, you know, up the Belize River, the east end of the Belize River, Burrell Boom and St. Paul's Bank and some of that, that area there. And, um, and then Orange Walk also has some. But to, the large, you know, to a large extent, most of the Creole population has remained here in Belize City. And, um, and, and yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting when you start to see some of those changes and how, you know, and, and how that some of those historical events have affected the modern day Belize. Yeah, but there has to be a relationship between the dispossession and disenfranchisement of the Creoles as black people. Mm -hmm. And we know the, the, the history of racism, especially by the the colonialists against yeah. black people and, and the fact that their occupation in Belize is the longest uninterrupted, yet this ethnic group, they get the least respect. Nobody's talking about a homeland for the Creole or, in fact, you know, um, um, from a demographic perspective, it is the smallest portion of the population it's ever been. 
And we have an amnesty that's starting next month, which will bring in 40,000, which will, they estimate, legitimize 40,000 people, 10% of our population. Wow. 40,000, that's the official estimate. And those people are from Central America. That, and so what happens to the Creole? They become a smaller and smaller number. And these are the, <clears throat> these are the head cornerstone yeah. of our society historically. So certainly a, a, a potent historical, social historical dynamic to look at. But I want to look at this in the concept, in the context of niche, because you know, um, niche should be the one that is able to invest people with the knowledge. I had a young Creole drummer here. One of the most moving moments I've ever had. Um, Musa Shahid, yeah, he sat here and he said that he's a Creole drummer and he wishes he were a, a, a Garifuna because he gets no respect, he gets no gigs and they did not even invite him to play for the people who enslaved the Creoles. When the prince came, they sent in a Hopkins and they made them prince. Which prince was it? Harry William Dickey something, whatever his name was. Prince. Prince and Kate Coyne. And they made them dance with the Garifuna and Hopkins. People who were never enslaved. And he said they didn't even, there wasn't one Creole event. Right? There wasn't, this is the level of shift in this country's consciousness. There wasn't one Creole event. And he lamented they're not even make we dance for the people who enslave we. So it's at, the, at one point it's jarring, but at the other point it's like, wow, you see how things change. Yeah. When the queen came here in the 80s, you could not have, have had her visit without a Creole presentation. I was there, Mr. Peters made a play Bowman Chan. Dead. D.E.D. What, what I, and I know I'm, I'm, I, I'm not the guest on the show. I'm talking so much, it seems like I am. <laughs> but what, what, what do you make of Nietzsche's role in allowing young Belizeans of African descent to be able to understand their place and, their, and, and a paramount place in Belizean history, longest uninterrupted occupation? Yeah. What is the role of the museum what is the role of niche in investing Creole children with that knowledge and certainty that we are a big part of this society? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, niche plays a very important role. Um, and, and in fact, you know, I remember when I was here as, a, as director, um, government at the time was trying to introduce African and Maya studies into the elementary school system. And... I think that, you know, one, the, one, some of the ways that, that Niche can try to bring some of these things to the forefront is by starting to develop programs, information that can highlight some of the significance that different ethnic groups can play and should play and that we, how we should identify them. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain that to you. You mentioned a homeland. And, you know, my concern as a Belizean is that if we all start to claim homelands, we're going to end up <clears throat> with a balkanization of Belize. We're going to split up this country into little pieces that will not be viable, will not survive. The homeland goes from the Rio Hondo to the Sarstun, and from that line that creates the border between Guatemala and where all of us live, and the Caribbean Sea. There should be one homeland, from my point of view, for everybody. Now, having said that, let's go Many back. Many people would argue, <clears throat> continue. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I know some people would argue against that, but I guess I'm a national, nationalist yeah. in that sense because I want this to be homeland for all Belizeans. Now, I think that we need to celebrate. We need to highlight the many, not just the one or two, the many, many contributions that Creole culture has contributed to who we are, right? Um, there are so many symbols that we can highlight that really have their origin in, in Creole culture. Let's go back to the formation of this country. Right? Who is it that, you know, <clears throat> finally agree and essentially tip the odds to stay and defend 
That was bank. So goes the legend. I don't believe it, but continue. But at least, you uh -huh. know, if, if... But that is also archival information. No, unless somebody was lying in that archival information. People lying at the archives right you now, know. but go ahead. So, uh -huh. so we, we, can, we can take it all the way to that, you know, right. to that historical point. 1798. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not sure it was. Yeah, it was the year June. Before. Yes. Or it was the year before in June. Yes, yeah. and you know, they they decide, okay, we're going to stay. Because they had left before and they, they, they got captured. Right. They, yeah. they had stayed before, got attacked, got captured, and then taken to Cuba, and then eventually some of them get back. Um, so, you know, even the, the establishment of this country as a country, you know, we can credit many of the Creole ancestors for being willing to fight or to stay and fight. When we look at our flag, the Belize flag is the only flag with people on it. No other flag in the world. I think Malta has some very small people, but yeah, yeah, that's but probably. We're, the one we're one of two. Yeah, we have it, but we have yes, it big, big, right? And when you look at the images, on the accurate right depiction of right. that, we're looking at Creole culture right. being represented in our flag. And again, I think it's something we need to, to highlight and celebrate. When we think about the, you know, the, the, really, the true national language of Belize, it's not English. Yes, we're taught English in schools, and you know, we all speak English, or a version of English. Right. It's like I was saying that watch how Creole language, how critical it is. If you're in a bus, this was my example, and you're coming from... Penke, and there's a checkpoint, and the police goes into that bus. And if he looks at you and you don't really look like, you know, like your banya, and they say, paper, you go, what are you talking about? Our response is in Creole. And as soon as you do that, oh, sorry, it's obvious that you're Belizean. So the Creole language unites us. It is really what, you know, sets us apart from our Central American neighbors. The, you know, the, the original music of Belize, I mean, today a lot of people will listen to, Punta, or rap, right, right. sadly. Um, I'm not a big rap fan, but that's personal. Our leader of the opposition is a rapper, sir. <laughs> Continue. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I, nothing against rap, but yeah, I, yeah. it's not. You're, it's but also it's, known as Wolf. Continue you you talk about Mr. Peters. Right. It was Brockdown music. Who develops Brockdown music? That's a Creole expression. Right. Right? And again, I think we need to be proud of, of, of that. And we need, again, not just you know, to identify, we need to celebrate it. Right? And what role does Niche play? So Niche's role then is to promote some of these, right, some of, some of these important parts of our cultural heritage that we owe a lot. In fact, What's the national dish of Belize? R&B, rice and beans. Who? Creole. Thank you, right? Or a national dish. So we have, but you see, and, and this is the, is, is the dichotomy. In anthropology and archaeology, you are celebrating the dead. And why do I say this? Because I'm saying that we want to talk about this culture, but we want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about the living descendants who are going through a, a, a violence crisis. A violence crisis. Nobody want to talk about that. They could talk about the two-man panel flag. They look yeah. cool. They could talk about rights and means, but I'm saying that, that, that archaeology and anthropology has to evolve, that it can address the, 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 social, the social dynamics yeah. of, of the groups in the present state. You can't have a disconnection between the Maya of the present day, which is the poorest population, statistically in Belize, and say, look at the untold treasures of the Mayan ruins. It's BS, right? It rings very hollow. Because how can they be the poorest people in Belize in the Toledo district? That's what the Poverty mm -hmm. Assessment Survey says. But at the same time, the rich traditions of our Maya people are something like chief, true? Right? That's, that's yeah. the voice I'm going for. But, but let me play the, the devil's advocate on you. Good. I know you like playing the devil's advocate. Switch it up. Oh, no, Switch it up. Right? So... <clears throat> You're good at identifying the problems. Yes. What about the solutions? 
That's so, why I'm saying... So, so let's go to that now. Yeah, so from we, Mitch. So we, we look and see, okay, why is it right, that we have such high crime in the city? Um, you pointed one thing out earlier. There's disenfranchisement, um, where certain opportunities were not provided for certain groups, certain the members ability in... to develop a peasantry. Yes. Yes. So that's one of the problems. Another problem, as we know, crime usually becomes more rampant where people have less economic opportunities. Yeah. So we need to identify that too, right? And as anthropologists, we, you know, these are some of the things that, that we do. I like to look for solutions, right? You identify the problem, but then how can we make changes? Now, if we're going to provide certain kinds of, like I remember in the 80s, when the first sort of wave of refugees came from Central America, that's when the ethnic balance started to become seriously affected. Right. Because up to until then, right, let's call them African Belizeans or you know, Creoles, Garifuna, um, they were the majority, especially Creoles were the majority ethnic group in the country. And when we started to get this wave of migration because of the wars in El Salvador and Guatemala, and government and the United Nations, etc., created Valley of Peace. UNHCR. Remember Valley, Valley of Peace? Valley of Peace, Ancien Matthews. <clears throat> and it was like, we will give people 50 acres of land and they can come in. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think the offer was not just made to the refugees, but also to Belizeans. It was, yeah. So yeah, that's any that's Belizean, why it was to work. Yes. Because the idea was that integration. Right. As Ancien Matthews is a demonstration of that. Yes. And, um, and so I think that if we're going to continue doing this, we have to create these kinds of opportunities for all Belizeans. Um, maybe we need to, to, again, go back to that plan and see, did it work? Did it fail? What or how could we make it better? And then perhaps that could provide opportunities for some folks um, to, again, to give them economic opportunities. Well, that's where niche comes in. Because niche should do the work of creating a cultural contamination of pride, that you should be contaminated with pride as a, as a descendant of the Africans who were brought to Belize, of the enslaved persons brought to Belize. Yeah. And, and that's where niche is failing. And you know that I was very involved with niche in those seminal years, and where, when you were there as well. But I don't feel that Niche is doing... I understand um, their, their entire bankroll comes from heritage tourism, and that fell apart during COVID. But I do not see Niche moving with the urgency to create a cohesive sense of identity and pride in children of African descent in Belize. I don't feel that the, that the spirit is there. I feel that the spirit is just there. If sell ticket and all chain, if you make that, if you make that tourists, if you go through the caves. Yeah. I, you know, in, in some ways, I think that we, we also need to understand, though, that you know, niche right now is, is going through a major transition. Um, you pointed out the, the pandemic, right? right? I mean, the pandemic hit especially cultural organizations, not just in Belize, all over the world. Um, you know, cult, cultural organizations took a big hit. Um, a lot of their funding dried up. In the case of Belize, as you pointed out, you know, because so many of the programs that Niche ran and operated in the past, it was, you know, we were doing really well with tourism. Right now, cruise tourism is still quite low. It hasn't bounced hasn't back to where it was. Yeah. So Niche has a lot less funds to, to really operate many of its programs that were operated in the past. The other kind of transition is we just had a change of administration right. um, where we went you know, from the UDP, now we have the, the PUP uh, administration in. Um, and so there's some adjustments that need to be made with some of these political changes. And then another, even another transition is in terms of directorship and leadership, right? So, but Jaime, I, and I'll, I'll just interrupt you there because we're winding down. Um, but Jaime, is that a problem that you've experienced in Belize? You serve four administrations, two PUP, two UDP. 
And I know you as being non-political, though I'm sure politicians have their own view. But my point is, the petty, small-minded politics of beliefs that, boy, he not PUP, he not work with me, he not UDP, she not work with me, that sort of, of narrow thinking contaminates culture as well. And is that something that, that made you rethink your long occupation and believe that it's just too freaking hard to do the political dance for 20 years? I have to dance and samba for PUP, I have to dance and punta for UDP. It just, it's impossible because these people are, they, they, they have unrealistic expectations of what a, 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 a public employee should do. Is this something that frustrated you? You know, I, to be honest with you, I, I can't say that it did. Um, I, I don't know why, you know. God what, bless what, your soul, Jaime Awe. I, I, I really, I, um, you know, I worked well with both administrations, you said, right? There were four different. But uh, it has to be frustrating as a professional to work with myopic people. Well, that's in, in any walk of life. But, you know, I, what I used to do when... I don't think when that applies there. at NAU, where you're a professor. Oh, gosh. Anyone who tells you that, you know, working at a university doesn't have its own political challenges I'm would, very aware would be lying. Yeah, that's right? true. Because yeah. you have deans and provosts yeah, yeah, yeah. With, their, Everybody got with, turf. with their agenda. Um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, I, what I tried to do when I was there was, um, you know, to... To make it very clear and very obvious that my dedication, my, you know, my efforts were about how do we make Belize's cultural heritage, first and foremost, the, the, the job that we needed to do at archaeology and by extension niche. And, you know, I, the onus was on me to convince, you know, whether it was the minister or the president, because the president's you know, were more political uh, right. appointees, and, and that still, you know, holds today, that continues. And so I felt that, you know, my role was to convince them. You know, I worked when Yasser Musa was, was president of Nature, and also Diane Halak, <clears throat> one PUP, one, one UDP. And, um, and I said, look, I'm here to champion the archaeological heritage of Belize, and I will do that. And, you know, regardless of the politics. Um, and I think that, you know, many of my colleagues at, at, at archaeology are of the same, you know, same bent. You know, that's, they're professionals, I first know and that. foremost. I know that personally, yeah. And so I think that, you know, I would like to see that we start to, to consider that, you know, some, you know, so, some members, but also th there's a responsibility on us professionals. To, to keep a certain distance from the politics, you know, and not play the politics. And, and, and I think, you know, I tried to do that um, because first and foremost, it was the archaeological heritage that was near and dear to me. Um, and, and that still remains the case. And that's why I still will continue doing the kind of work I do for the country of Belize. I don't do it for Jaime Awe, I don't do it for, you know, for any political party. I do it for the people of Belize. We'll end on that very optimistic, and I, I know it to be a very true note. Um, thanks so much, Jaime, for taking time. We've been trying to do this for a number of years to, to <clears throat> catch up. We're very grateful for you uh, coming all the way down from Cayo and uh, taking time to do this. We want to thank our sponsors, Benny's Home Center, Belize Tax Services, Galenia Hospital, Nando's Wholesale, Oceana and Belize, Travelers Limited, and Universal Hardware Company Limited. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We're going to take a break. We don't know how long the break will be, a couple of weeks for sure, but um, we'll see what August brings, but we'll definitely be back uh, with Uncut within the next month or so, we hope. Um, it won't be uh, I, an interrupted uh, Interrupted season will be uninterrupted, but we're taking a short interregnum. So stay tuned and we'll let you know when the next one cut appears. Again, hi, man. Thanks so much. We could talk until midnight and I wouldn't be bored. <laughs> but thanks so much for your time. Thanks for inviting me. Good night, viewers. Have a good night.